Hey guys, we're back. Here we are. Um, <laughs> as, as promised, it's time for the next session. It's noon and it's time to hear about the 10 things that Dylan Harbour hated about moving to an SPA. We've got quite a few sessions on NUX, SPA, um, SSL, static, mm -hmm. statically generated sites. So this is this like fits right into our track. Um, let's just go yeah. ahead and bring Dylan in. What do you think? Yes. Hello, Dylan. Hey, Dylan. Hi, good Dylan. afternoon. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, good. It's good. nice to have um, you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's awesome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. So, Dylan, how are you feeling? Um, <laughs> ready for the session? Uh, have you been looking at the previous sessions um, for over the days? Uh, yes, I, I haven't actually caught up on as, as many as I was hoping to. Um, I've been mm -hmm. dealing with a whole lot of other things, but uh, I'm definitely keen to play back quite a few of the sessions and um, yeah. and catch up on them over the, the next couple of weeks when they go live. Yeah, I guess awesome. that's that's the pros of not being physical and instead going virtual. You, you can, you know, rewind and check it out afterwards, maybe over yeah. the weekend. Definitely. Uh, yes. You had another session um, before, right? Yesterday. Um, yeah. Yesterday, yeah, in, in, yes, in one of the other right. um, streams. So, yeah, we are happy to have you in our stream now, New As God. Yes, we, oh, <laughs> yes, nice, nice to see some new faces on the side. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dylan, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what do you do uh, before we dive into the session? Sure, perfect. Um, so, I'm the head of engineering for marketplaces at Ringia South Africa. Um, at Ringia, we build the software and the platforms that drive classified marketplaces around the world. So if you think about your, your traditional marketplaces of dealing in cars or property or jobs or what we call a horizontal, a, a general classified platform where you can buy anything from a cell phone to a spare tire, um, anything in between, we build the actual software. We don't run any of the operations, but we just build the technology and um, let that uh, be rolled out in multiple countries and um, with a specific wow. focus on emerging markets um, of Africa and Southeast Asia at the moment. Yeah, so you are not the, the actual seller in a way, you're the facilitator, you give them the tools so that they can um, run their business. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yes. awesome. Um, so Dylan, um, I hear, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to your session. Um, I've worked a lot with SPAs, um, not a lot, um, not as much as I'd like. <laughs> so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay tuned to this. Um, and for our viewers, don't forget to leave your questions, to leave your comments and feedbacks in the chat. We'll be right there with you and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. All right. So okay. it's all you, Dylan. Dylan. Yep. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so 10 things I hated about moving to an SPA. Um, I've already done a little bit of an intro about myself, um, but uh, just a little bit more. Um, so I come more from more of a, a back-end PHP development background um, before I got into more of the, the management spaces. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of Laravel and the ecosystem that's come up around Laravel, and I'm currently digging into the tool stack, which is Tailwind, Alpine.js, uh, Laravel, and Livewire. Um, so, like I said, Ringia South Africa, we build classified marketplaces. Um, one of the reasons that that I'm involved in this conference and one of the reasons that we want to be involved in this conference is because we run one of our teams straight out of Mauritius. Um, so uh, this is uh, Matt Hood and Atimbang and the gang um, all on the beaches of Mauritius. And uh, I was really hoping that this would be my excuse to come and visit uh, the team there and, and see Mauritius for myself. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the pandemic has, has stifled those plans. Um, but uh, let's discuss a little bit more about where we were at as Ringia South Africa um, and our sister entity, Ringia One Africa Media, at the time of digging into the, the SPA um, experiment that we went down. So at the time, this was about two years ago when we started down this road, uh, we were about 40 plus developers and we're spread ac across half a dozen countries. Um, currently, we're using more of a remote first approach and, and we're very committed to remote working. Um, so we do have multiple developers in, in different regions and in different countries. Um, but w through the, the, the systems that we had developed, um, they were generally more of a Laravel focus, more of a, a traditional server rendered, um, PHP rendered um, type of, of architecture. 
And we had managed to roll that out across a number of marketplaces, so more than 20 marketplaces around Africa um, that had had um, gotten our solution in, in how we rolled out these marketplaces. Um, but we had come across some frustrations with the way that our front-end stack um, was was coming together. So we had quite a um, quite quite a few different approaches between the different teams. Um, we had uh, various different technologies that we were using. We had um, a few different CSS frameworks. We had um, some people using a little bit of Vue.js and a little bit of React, um, but most of those were not in the true SPA sense. Um, they were just in in using small bits and pieces that um, that that added to a little bit of the the reactivity of a page. So um, in in uh, trying to get to a point where, where we had more of a strategy with what we were doing with, with our front end stack, uh, we ventured into the SBA space and we decided to try and do a proof of concept um, in, in one of the ventures with a, a, a true, correct, uh, modern SBA approach. Um, so we chose Vue.js for, for our tooling of choice, um, but there, there wasn't any, any um, any reason for, well, any major reason why we chose Vue compared to React or Angular. I think any of those are, are decent choices as well. Um, and we decided to, to um, experiment with, with Vue.js in, in driving the full front-end application um, for one of our platforms. So this coincided with quite a big rebuild that we were busy doing. We had actually started to take over the, the first of our, um, our ventures outside of Africa. Um, and this was the first um, Asian venture that we were able to to um, develop software for. Um, so we used this as a, a good time to experiment and, and threw in a few little curveballs at the same time in um, redesigning our entire infrastructure pipeline as well, uh, moving over from more of a, a, a traditional EC2 AWS powered infrastructure um, to a more modernized Fargate Docker powered infrastructure. And we brought in Terraform, we brought in a whole lot of new technologies on the infrastructure layer as well. On the back end, we improved some of our API um, approaches and try to modernize the way that we were bringing the, the Laravel a APIs together. Um, but one of the, the biggest changes and probably the most fundamental change was on that front end side um, on, on rolling out an SPA in a true SPA sense for the first time um, within these vertical spaces um, and trying to, to see the, the pros and cons of how that all came together. So how did that work for us and how did it come come out? Um, to be honest, it, it wasn't it wasn't terrible. It was actually quite a successful project. Um, we managed to get all of the, the important KPIs, all the important metrics um, up. We managed to deliver a product that got to production eventually and um, managed to um, managed to, to, to tick the boxes that we needed to tick for the most part. Um, and for, for all intents and purposes, we could call this project a success. It was a platform that was beautiful, it was responsive, it worked the way that we wanted to, it did everything that it needed to do. Um, but it just came with a lot of extra gray hair. Um, these, these gray hairs in my beard, probably half of them came from this project um, and came from the frustrations that we came, that, that came up um, during the, the approach of moving to an SPA. So um, out of that frustration, um, this, is, this is basically where the talk came from. We are not haters of the SPA technology space. We're not haters of Vue.js or React or Angular or any of the other great tools that are out there. Um, but we, we did uh, find that um, there were a few gotchas that we were not really well prepared for or that we underestimated when we went down this road of rolling out an SPA. Um, and that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today. So before we get into it, um, a, a single a, a, a SPA, single page application, what is it exactly um, and uh, what are we actually talking about in, in making the move from a traditional server-ended application to an SPA? So Wikipedia defines an SPA as a web application or a website that interacts with the web browser by dynamically rewriting the current web page with new data from the web server instead of the default method of the browser loading entire new pages. Um, so the goal is faster transitions that make the website feel more like a native app. Um, and I think that's a great summary um, in, in the, ma the main difference with an SPA being that you don't get that, in, that full new page render for every click that um, a user goes through. So um, rather you'll just update this, the components or update the, the small sections of the page that you're really working with. 
um, and you won't roll out um, a, a full new page reload for, for each one. In addition to that, um, there's a lot of the fundamental responsibilities that used to be back-end specific, which now move over to being front-end specific. Um, so your routing, for example, is, is generally a back-end responsibility. Uh, it's something that has, especially in the Laravel space, has been firmly responsible in, in you know, the back-end part of things. Um, and generally in, in, in most web spaces, that's that hasn't been a responsibility of JavaScript. It's been a responsibility of what's, what's on the server side that's actually driving it. Um, so that routing is a big change that shifts over from being a back end to a front end responsibility. Your your state management um, is quite a big change as well. Um, that's, that creates a space where your browser can maintain the state of an application um, and kind of configure itself in different ways and, and update different components depending on what's happening with, with the state of the application. Um, and because of that, a lot of your business logic ends up moving or being duplicated from being back-end business logic to being front-end business logic as well. So you could see that as a feature or a flaw, um, but that is one of the the, um, the side effects of, of going with an SPA route is, is putting a lot of this business logic in the, the front-end code base. So generally, SPAs are rolled out with one of the big frameworks, um, like we mentioned, Vue.js, React, Angular, um, and there's a few different flavors of how you do that. Um, there's the next and the next options as well um, if you're bringing server-side rendering in, um, and there's tons of other options as well for how to roll out an SPA. These aren't the only three, um, but these are definitely the biggest three by a long shot. And I think all of them are, are quite robust. Um, they've got quite active communities. They've got great um, reasons for using them. Um, and I don't really think it's worth bashing any of them because because all three have um, have quite a robust um, op option, or a quite a robust option for developers to choose. So in practical examples, what does this actually look like? Um, I went off the the React uh, documentation, found an example app, and this is what came up. It's it's just a basic calculator app. So if you've used uh, the calculator on your cell phone, it probably looks very similar to this. Um, and this is a great example in showing some of the benefits of an SPA, SPA and some of the reasons why people choose to use an SPA um, type of approach. So um, as you interact with this application, it will feel a lot like a native application. It will feel like um, a something that's very responsive and reactive to, to um, what you're doing as you're clicking the buttons and putting multiplications and, and additions in, um, the totals will update immediately, um, and there isn't any full renders that are happening every time you click a button to reload the page. Um, so it really does show, although it's a very simple application, it shows some of those benefits in, in the, the UX that you can really present, um, because trying to do this in a non-SPA type of approach will be a lot more cumbersome, a lot harder to implement, and generally not result in 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 something that's as neat and um, and well implemented. So in HTML, what does that actually look like? Um, if you look here, we've got a uh, a JavaScript bundle that's included, um, and we'll have a a very simple, very very um, minimal. Uh, HTML DOM in, in the actual body section. So there, there isn't much there. It's literally, what is that, four lines of code um, in your HTML that make up this entire page. And that's because all you're really doing is you're defining an element there, a container that the React application can um, attach onto and, and start to do its magic. Um, so there isn't really much in the HTML sense here. Um, this is just a very small static HTML page um, with a link and, and uh, an href to the, the fork me on GitHub link. Um, and that's pretty much it. So if you actually had to uh, load this up without JavaScript or on an incredibly slow client, um, you might see something that looks more like this. And this is really what that application looks like from an HTML sense. Um, you've got the fork me on GitHub um, ribbon at the top, and then you've got an empty, an empty div. There's nothing else to it. Um, but once you've loaded that up, uh, the React application in this in this case takes over, and it will uh, it will start to build out the components of that calculator. It will start to add the buttons that need to be there. It will start to initialize any state that needs to be there. Um, and by the time that that JavaScript has finished doing its work, um, you'll have the entire application, the entire calculator that's available to you. 
So why do people bother with this? Um, we've touched on this a little bit, but obviously you get that app-like experience. Um, it's a significantly different experience and, and a, a different way that you can um, interact with your users through an SPA um, because it's really built around reactivity. It's built around um, that um, ability to update in real time and do the, the small component swap outs and, and that reactive nature of a page. Uh, you also get um, the updates that DOM without requiring the full page reload. Uh, you, you get an easier, it's easier to develop uh, easier to develop beautiful interfaces. Um, so you, you need to, um, you have the ability to, to work with within a different space um, as a developer and it's easier for those developers to, to develop beautiful interfaces. Um, you have isolation of the front end away from the back end. This is one that we were really hoping for um, as a team because we, we definitely saw how some front end resources who didn't really come from a PHP background battle to work within the Laravel space. Um, and it would, would have been nice or it is nice for front end resources to just focus on the front end tool, tooling, the front end um, ecosystem rather than having to do their work within Laravel blade components or Laravel blade views. You also get easier deployments um, if you're just doing a, a simple SPA at least. Um, so all that you've got here, like we saw in that calculator example, is a static HTML, a static um, JavaScript bundle. And you take those together, you put them on a CDN or you put them in Amazon's S3 or something like that. And you can deploy that as many times as you like. It's super cheap, it's super easy, it's super efficient, and it scales almost infinitely um, with, without having any um, infrastructure that you actually have to provision. And then another one, uh, we, we build uh, not just the client side applications, but we also have some Android applications that we support in some of our markets. And it, uh, was, it was a great opportunity for us to build out APIs that could be reused um, not just on the, the SPA, but also on um, on any of the Android applications or desktop applications or anything else um, that that had had to have the same type of functionality. So you can build out one API um, and and have multiple different clients interacting with that API, um, which can be a huge benefit to the productivity of the team. So that sounds all good and well, um, but this talk is why we hated moving to an SBA. So we need to get into some of the negative side of things um, and some of the frustrations that we did face. The first one that I put down is the full stack myth. Um, now, I, I know that this might offend some people and not everyone would, would necessarily agree with me on this, um, but please do hear what I'm saying um, and, and understand the, the reasons for this being the first point. Um, so I think if, if you, um, if you work in in any large scale application, um, it, it, there's definitely some developers that have the ability to to get into the details of of multiple parts of that. If it's the DevOps side or the infrastructure side, the front end, the back end, the database, um, we can all get an element of understanding of each of those layers. But as you get more into the specifics, into the advanced side of each of those layers, you really need to get some type of specialization. And even though we we could have developers or we do have develop, developers that are competent at working with um, with front end technologies, um, we did find that the the level that we needed to get our JavaScript engineers to was significantly higher when we moved over to an SPA. I think SPAs are one of those things which have a um, a, a very easy learning curve in the beginning. And then as you get into the, the very advanced stuff, you, you really have to level up to a, a completely different level to understand um, and to debug and to add features in, in a significantly more advanced way. And we definitely found that. So we had to, um, we had to upskill a lot of our developers quite significantly and get more focus on um, proper JavaScript engineers that, that had um, dedication to getting into the meat of what JavaScript has to offer. Um, and not just have general full stack guys um, or girls that could could take the um, the 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 general you know approaches of of the basics of SPAs and of front end stack and of the back end stack and kind of get by with it. Um, so I think I think it's the main point here is just that you you really need to um, get significantly more advanced engineers if you get um, into the meat of what what an SPA has to offer, um, and especially if you have very complex and very custom requirements in the way that you roll them out. Number two, SEO. Um, now, 
classified marketplaces in the in the, the space that we operate in, they live or die based on the success of their organic traffic. Um, there isn't an option for you to have a sustainable classified marketplace if you don't have good SEO. Um, and SEO became a major requirement that we had to fulfill as a team and as an organization to make sure that the product that we were offering um, and the product that we were, we were building could actually have a, a, a decent lifetime ahead of it. So SPAs generally are, are known for reactivity. They're known for being app-like. They're not known for being great at SEO. Um, and there are some ways around that. We're going to dig into that now. Um, but overall, um, SPAs don't do well with SEO um, and they, they don't um, lend themselves to being easy to implement with good SEO. Um, so despite what, what you might have heard or read online, um, there, there are quite a few videos and, and talks and um, articles that go around saying that Google doesn't need you to um, to server render your, your content and Google can handle your JavaScript and all the rest. The reality is that your turnaround time in the Google indexing pipeline is going to be super, super bad if you don't actually have a full DOM available to, um, to the, the crawlers when they come to your website. And that may change in future. Um, but the reality is the test that we did, um, the partners that we were engaged with um, confirmed this with us. And, and there's absolutely no way that we could have gone to market um, without having, well, with just having an SEO, uh, uh, with just having an SPA um, without uh, SSR backing that. Um, the, the impact of, uh, of the bad SEO, um, apart from from Google indexing being quite slow or non-existent in some cases. Um, you've also got the meta tags that will be completely incorrect. Um, so your OG tags, your social sharing tags, as well, those social sharing previews, um, share on Facebook type of preview things um, will, will not have content specific um, details in them in some cases. Um, and then don't, don't even get me started on sitemaps. That's a whole nother complexity. I think it does depend on, on how your, um, how big your application is and how many, um, how many, how many pages or how many, uh, entities you really need to, to represent in your sitemaps. But the larger that becomes, the harder it is to do within an SPA space. And, and we ended up moving that out into its own microservice, um, and, and reverse proxying that in, but there, there's a lot of additional complexity that comes with sitemaps um, if you have very advanced requirements uh, or very large requirements with your sitemaps that don't play very well with SPAs. So that brings me to number three. Um, generally, the solution that's proposed and, and the well-accepted solution on the internet for, for um, the SEO issues that come with an SPA is to just apply SSR, um, to, to, to roll out an SPA that's backed with a, a server that will process do all the, the client side processing that needs to happen um, on a server, an intermediary server, and then um, send a more complete and a more up-to-date DOM to the browser on that initial page load. So why do we not like SSR? Um, it does work, definitely does work. We managed to get it to work. We managed to get the successes that we needed um, by, by rolling out SSR. Um, but overall, it's, uh, it's just something that steals the joy out of working with an SPA. Um, SPAs are so awesome to build because you can do things as a developer and you can see the awesome impact um, very quickly. There's very little work required to actually make things happen, make things happen that look really good, um, especially from a UX side and from an interactivity side. And then as soon as you bring SSR and you're just bringing a, a layer of complexity that steals that joy out of building with an SPA. So a few examples just on, on what the actual SSR does here. So let's go back to that calculator app. If you, if you had to load up that page um, with no JavaScript enabled, um, you would get just the empty body like we saw earlier three lines in there just with a little um, a tag with a, a, a fork me on GitHub. Um, but if you had server-side rendering backing that same that same application, it could look something more like this, where um, on that initial request, you get the full page that, that loads up, the full DOM is populated, and it includes the buttons, it includes um, the anything else, any links that need to be there, um, and, and that allows for crawlers as they're going through your website on that initial request, 
to actually see everything that needs to be on that page rather than have to wait for JavaScript to process or have to process the, the, the entirety of, of um, your, your, your thread basically before they can see the page and see the contents of that page. Um, so, so generally, SSR is implemented uh, with a, a few tooling helpers um, and or a few specific projects. Um, some of the bigger ones in the React space is, is Next.js and in the Vue space is Nuxt.js, um, kind of sister projects that do very similar things um, in helping you to implement it and, and making the implementation significantly easier. There's also a, a lot of other options. There's an official Vue SSR plugin that you can use um, with Vue.js if you don't want to use a Nuxt. And I think that generally our frustrations with SSR um, would be the same across any of those types of implementations because it's not necessarily just the tool itself, but it's, it's, it's also about the concept of, of why you're needing SSR and the, the additional layers of complexity that it brings. Um, so those reasons that, that you might end up reaching for it um, is to get that fully populated DOM on the initial request, the potential um, for a performance boost because now all of that work is not happening on the, the client side, on the browser side, but it's happening on the intermediary server side. And um, that can give you the ability to cache things there. It could give you a lot more performance if it's, a, if it's quite a beefy processor or, or quite a beefy server that's, that's actually doing that. Um, and you, you get the ability for search engines to index without requiring a JavaScript to process your, your page. Another one which which isn't normally quite um, spoken about, but we found that that the the ability to hook into middleware during that node process um, did help us solve some of these problems and some of the other problems as well. And that can also be a, a reason um, because you you get the ability to do things like um, whatever you want to put into like an express middleware or something like that as well. So uh, the reasons that we didn't like SSR, the reasons why we got frustrated by it, um, I think the, the biggest one, and, and it's quite hard to define this um, in, in like actual um, numerical terms, um, but the significant additional cognitive load that it brings to the party. Um, so you've now got a completely different paradigm. You know, you're no longer just thinking in the server side and the client side, but you've got something stuck in the middle that's not quite client and it's not quite server. It's kind of a little bit of both. Um, and you have to think about things differently. You have to um, you have to have a, a lot more understanding of what's actually happening and when it's happening. If it's happening on server server side render or if it's happening on hydration, um, and that additional cognitive load can add frustration. It can it can add um, additional um, processing or additional development time to the process. And it's just a, a little bit harder to work with, even if you can get it done in the end. That cognitive load isn't necessarily always welcome. Um, next up, the, it, it removes any infrastructure wins that you had with an SPA. So we spoke about just uh, taking your SPA, taking your static bundle, putting it on S3 or putting it on a CDN or something like that. Um, and you can serve your entire, your entire front end stack just like that. Um, but now you're introducing a process that needs to actually run somewhere. So you have to have a server or you have to have a container. You have to have something, um, especially if you don't run a backend that is JavaScript back, like a Node.js um, backend, then you're probably going to have to put down that additional infrastructure and lose any of the wins that you had with an SPA. Uh, we also found that it's a bug's nest, that it's, it's quite brittle code. And, and even developers that were quite familiar with the process, quite familiar with the code base and, and very competent as developers could still quite easily introduce bugs into the process. Um, obviously, the more testing you have, the easier you can catch that. Um, but generally, the, 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 the bugs that did reach production, um, in our case, almost always were related to SSR or, um, or the, the, the frustrations around um, the SSR understanding. And then another one um, is, is just that at, at what point does your SSR implementation just become another backend that you have to support? Um, we, we wanted to go this way to try and get some of the simplifications, some of the modernizations of our stack, and it felt like we were doing one step forward and two steps back. Um, and that just created some frustration, especially when you look at the wins that we were expecting to get, um, we didn't see those come in um, and, and it just became another thing that we had to think about, another thing that we had to support um, and it just stole that joy of working with an SPA. So that means it brings me to number four, um, the extra deployment complexity. 
I think that we've already touched on this um, in, in some parts um, in that you can't just deploy things through a, a CDN, um, but now you have to put down a process for that, a process, something that can process SSR. Um, but even if you're not using SSR, you could also still introduce other deployment complexities. Um, I mean, in our case, we chose to actually separate explicitly our front end and our back end code bases completely so that they were more standalone um, and independent of each other. And that's great in nature. I think there's there's a um, there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, but just that decision itself can also bring in other complexities in the way that you deploy that, in the way that you tie them together when you get the deployments out, in the way that you test it, um, and it can it can bring in um, a lot of extra frustrations with the way that deployments happen, your CI/CD processes happen. Um, so just something to keep in mind and, and to evaluate in your unique situation on, on whether it's worth that extra deployment complexity or whether you would you would personally have extra de deployment complexity. Next up is the that secrets get more complicated. Um, now this might be self-explanatory. It might be something that's completely obvious. Um, but again, it's just that additional cognitive load. It's it, it's that change of thinking, um, and it's sometimes a little bit frustrating to to have to try and find ways around this um, because now what's happened is you've taken some of your business logic, you've taken some of your 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 um, code that would normally be a back end responsibility where you have. Um, everything isolated away from public view. You have you have that running on your server. You've got um, a lot of security around that, um, and you know how to generally work with secrets. You know how to generally work with things that are more confidential in nature. Um, and as soon as you you start to shift a lot of this logic, a lot of this business processing, business logic through to the front end, um, you you can't move the secrets along with that. Um, and Obviously, there are ways around this. I mean, we managed to get ways around this, and, and it is somewhat just a, a learning process to go through. Um, but if you're going to be doing any integrations with third parties that require secrets, if it's a payment gateway or, or anything else, um, you, you might um, get a few frustrations in the way that that's handled. And if that isn't handled correctly, then your code base that's on the front end could, could um, create a lot of extra security holes within your, your um, application. If you don't actually understand um, the limitations of, of what you can and what you can't put in there. I think the long and the short of it is just that um, if you if you are putting anything in your JavaScript bundle, you have to treat that as being publicly available um, because anybody can look at what's in that JavaScript bundle. They can interrogate it. They can debug it. They can read through it. Um, and you you really are just revealing more to um, potential hackers, to potential users, um, and and, and it, it does get a little bit more complicated. So it's not to say it's impossible, um, but it is just a, a change in thinking and something that, that can be a little bit frustrating um, for developers to get their head around sometimes. Number six is the increased risk of exposing your data. Now, this is different to the secrets um, intentionally because this isn't talking about your code base, but rather talking about the data that drives your application. So this might also be unique to your industry. Um, in our industry, our data is what makes our companies valuable to a certain extent. Um, the fact that we have listings, the fact that we have um, content available that might not be available in other places. So there are always other parties that are trying to get their hands on that data. Um, they're trying to, trying to either scrape us or um, steal our data in some shape or form. And um, by going with an SPA, you're generally going with a, a, a um, an API-driven um, application. So you're going to have some type of JSON API um, or something similar on the other end that's feeding your SPA. And the fact that you're going with an API approach means that your data becomes um, easier for people to interrogate, um, to scrape, and to to steal, basically. Um, so that's something that might be unique to our context only and not necessarily applicable to everybody. Um, but your APIs are well-formed, they're well-structured, and they make it easier for other people to sniff around and see what's happening and actually start to pull that data apart. Number seven is the increased cost. Um, we did touch on this a little bit earlier, um, but the increased cost, I've got three different costs that, that, that we found increased significantly in moving to, to this specific SPA approach. 
The first is um, the infrastructure cost. I think we've touched on that already, especially if you're going to go with server-side rendering, then this becomes applicable, where you now need to roll out containers or servers or something that can actually run your SSR process. Um, and that increased cost um, is going to be felt at some point. Even if it's small, um, there definitely is something that that needs to run in in infrastructure somewhere. So it's, it's just going to be a, a, something that, that you need to suck up. Um, the second cost that increased for us is the hiring or the developer cost. Now, we were hiring a lot for this project and for other teams. Um, but as we started to include the requirements of having a detailed and a, and a, a, a real fundamental understanding of, of um, modern JavaScript approaches, that increased the the budget or it had to increase the budget of, of who, we were, who we were willing to hire um, because uh, we needed to find competent developers that understood these complexities that we were dealing with um, and that can increase your your hiring or your developer cost. It could also mean that that maybe you just need to hire a dedicated resource. So it could just be an extra headcount rather than increase increased cost of specific people. Um, but there they could be an increased cost, and we definitely saw an increased cost in in the developers um, that we needed to to employ to support this type of product. And then the third increased cost is the increased product and productivity cost. Um, so we found this is also completely anecdotal and this is just our personal experience. Um, but even once we became familiar with the stack, once we had things up and running, once we had it in production, um, the cost of actually rolling out these features did increase in some cases. And in some cases, it increased significantly um, because of these additional um, complexities of, of SSR and of um, the different um, cognitive load and some of the other things that I'm going to highlight later. Um, so we found that that we can do things faster, more effective, cheaper um, with, with not going with an SPA approach in some of these cases. And especially when you put SSR on top of that, um, then, then we can with the more traditional approaches. Number eight is HTTP status codes. Now, this might just be a personal peeve of mine um, because I come from more of the back-end space. And uh, one of the, the contracts, one of the, the fundamentals of how the web works is with HTTP status codes. Um, but in the SPA space, the HTTP status codes don't really mean all that much. I mean, you're updating small parts of components. Um, you're not doing those full page reloads. So generally, you don't get the ability to set specific HTTP status codes. You don't get the ability to, to manipulate them or to, to get control of them as a developer. Um, so that can cause huge frustration within, within the, um, the developer's spaces. And it also depends on, on, on how your, your international requirements um, or your, your requirements are for, for how your your status codes need to be need to respond. We we work a lot with with an international SEO team that has very specific requirements on what we need to do at specific places, um, because our um, our our organic traffic is so valuable to us. Um, and we found that in some of those requirements, it was really hard to actually implement it, or in some cases, impossible to implement it. Um, and especially the specific HTTP status codes that we needed to return at specific points in an application, um, because SPAs just don't give you that ability. So it sounds it sounds silly, um, but if you don't believe me, then take an SPA that you're busy playing with and just think through some scenarios of if you wanted to return different status codes, how you would do it and see if you can if you can be successful in that. Um, it, there are some ways around it, um, and especially if you're doing it with server-side render, there's some, there's some options of doing it on that initial request, um, but it's completely not possible to do it in, in some of those other scenarios and especially on the hydration side of things. Number nine is external tooling frustrations. Um, so I think th there's there's a few a few big ones like Google Analytics, um, which most people will be be familiar with. Um, we had a few more unique scenarios as well with with things like OneSignal or Sail Through, which are uh, our toolkits, marketing tooling that we integrate with um, and and we support. And um, the the documentation and the the plugins or the SDKs or the the options available for implementing those are generally geared towards non SPA approaches. Um, so if you're going to integrate with any external party, um, generally you, you you're going to have a few frustrations and in some cases a, a, a lot of frustrations in trying to get these things rolled out. So this is a great example of 
of how we had um, significant extra complexity and extra cost in rolling out um, the same type of thing on different applications because we would take um, one of our, our implementations of, of some of these tools and roll it out across an SPA and a non-SPA non at the same time. And it would take 10 times longer to roll it out on an SPA. Um, and that's just because the, the, the tooling that's provided um, is not going to necessarily work with an SPA. And even your big, your big players like Google Analytics, they don't work very well with um with spas as well they have their own issues in tracking sessions and and even once you and and tons of other things as well but even once you you really get it working um we've still seen weeks later months later that that additional issues that we didn't know about came up and we had to do some little custom hacks in our in our code base to try and get google analytics to work as well so um this might also be unique to your implementation and unique to your product offering. Um, but if you're going to be integrating with external tooling, um, just keep that in mind and see how easy it would be um, to do that with an SPA versus a non-SPA approach. Number 10, um, the last major point here is the advanced route handling. Um, now, again, this is maybe more unique to our case, um, but this is our story that we get to tell here. And uh, we, we, have, we have the requirements of having quite advanced routing um, patterns that we had to support. And often those are driven completely by databases. So it's not something that we can really put in static files because the number of combinations that could exist could be exorbitant. Um, so here we've got you know, offer type, category, location, one, location two that we need to support. If you took all the numbers of variables that could be in there, um, valid and invalid options, you would end up with about 1.4 million possibilities, which is completely impossible to put in um, in a, a, an SPA's code base um, in, in doing it directly in the bundle. So we would end up offloading that onto an API and having different logic to handle things depending on whether it's SSR that's handling it or on hydration that's handi handling it. Um, but overall, um, it just gives a lot of extra complexity because you don't have the database available to directly query when you're busy resolving your route. So in a more traditional, um, old school, um, olden day way of doing things, um, when your, your route is, is being resolved, um, these parameters can be queried directly and you don't have that additional lag of, of additional API HTTP connections that need to happen. Um, and you, you're not introducing a, a very early blocking requirement into the process. Um, so we did manage to get this to work. Um, uh, like I said, most of these things you can get around, um, but it just came with that increased cost of implementation, the increased cognitive load of supporting it, and a bit of developer frustration as you're doing that. So that's the 10 things. Um, a few bonus thoughts um, from me. So first of all, the, the um, depending on your implementation and depending on the, the tooling that you're using, um, you should also just watch out for these types of things because these can also be common problems with SPAs. Um, the accessibility, especially in the older implementations, um, there's, there's very little support for that. Performance um, can be good or bad and the longevity um, or the the breaking versions that you that that are supported by by that specific framework. I think many of the communities have had significant breaking changes in versions um, over the last couple of years. Um, some better than others, um, but generally this is still quite a new technology. And if you're working with something that has quite a long lifespan, you may deal with some major breaking versions um, as you go through this lifespan. And then some standard browser features like your back and forward buttons and your bookmarks and stuff like that might also not work. So uh, like I said in the beginning, we're not haters of SPAs. Um, we had some frustrations, but we, we do believe in the technology. We do believe in, in the community and we love what it can bring to the table in the right situation. But we just found that um, in our case, anything that has an SEO requirement, an advanced SEO requirement in that case, um, something that we needed to really get into the nuts and bolts of, we could do better in a non-SPA type of approach and rather use other things for the reactivity layer or the, the interactivity layer. Um, so we're currently experimenting quite a bit with Livewire. Um, but there's also a, a lot of other options um, that you can look into. There's also Inertia JS, which kind of ties a little bit of the SPAs together with a, a non-SPA type of approach. Um, and then just generally using other types of, of uses for 
your Vue.js and your React.js in, in, um, in, in just uh, decorating parts of your, your reactivity or parts of your, your pages with reactivity rather than doing a full SPA approach. Um, and there are different approaches to that if, if, um, if SEO is a major requirement. We're going to rather go down that road in future um, and keep SPAs for logged in applications and for applications that don't have a major SEO requirement. Um, we'll also look at them for ancillary or standalone applications and things that might become a PWA um, because I think those are really powerful and that's where SPAs um, can also shine through and, and do a much better job than your, your more traditional um, applications. And any internal tooling, any dashboarding, anything like that um, would, would also go a long way in, um, in being rolled out as an SPA. So that's it. Um, to recap, those are the 10 things that I hated about moving to an SPA. Um, I do hope that you you have learned something um, and I hope that you, you take this within the right spirit that it's presented with. Um, but if you have any questions, you're welcome to hit me up on Twitter um, or drop me an email or we can chat about it now. I think we've still got a few minutes. Thanks very much. Hey, Dylan. Hey. That Thank was you so an much. awesome session. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thanks. We've got quite some activity in the chat, actually. A yeah, lot of people. Yeah, you've got quite a debate in there. <laughs> yeah, quite a debate in the chat where um, sure. they are like sympathizing with the things that you mentioned, the, the, the issues you faced with SPA. Um, and the, the debate is actually on, it started when which someone asked. Which one is the worst uh, one? <laughs> yeah, which one, <laughs> which one is the worst one? Um, <laughs> We are gonna, the we're worst gonna let points or the worst, the worst technology? All right. <laughs> Go ahead. The, 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 it was the worst um, issue. The worst issue uh, you encountered. Yeah. The worst issue. Well, That's look, to, to be honest, when I presented this, um, this idea to my team, when I said, look, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of doing a talk on the 10 things I hated about an SPA, most of the responses came back saying, you could just do 10 things I hate about SSR, um, because that's basically the summary of everything is, is um, uh, you, you can generally stomach a lot of the rest of it. Um, but the SSR is really what takes it from being something that's a great experience to being something that's just like, a oh, it's just such a slug. It's just so frustrating um, when you, you just lose that joy. Um, and and that's that's the, the experience that our team had, um, not just myself, um, but uh, but the, the entire team really just lost that joy with, with SSR <laughs> and, and kind of stole that joy from SPAs. Yeah, that's that's exactly in line with what everyone is talking about in, in the live chat. Um, so when, when the question was asked, what was the worst, um, you know, the thing that you could hate the most? Uh, yeah, everyone was like, SSO, I can bet on SSO. SSO is the winner here. <laughs> <laughs> Very so the true. feeling is, is globally mutual, apparently. Um, yeah. Yeah, but th there is a, a follow-up question. Um, what's the worst bug or worst thing about SSO, basically, that made it so hard to, to handle with an SPA? Wow. Um, <laughs> Too many. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worst thing. Um, I think for me, it was the routing. Um, I think because it, it, it introduced... Um, such a such a, a hard block into the way that we could handle requests. Um, uh -huh. We basically had to um, during the, the SSR, the initial SSR process, we had to resolve all of the routing patterns um, that 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 uh, that could be introduced, um, and that that was quite cumbersome and quite frustrating to do, and and did introduce a lot of additional bugs um, just in that one parts of the application. Um, so SSR together with the routing, those things kind of overlap together um, and, and it brought a whole lot of bugs together with like it. So I think that, that was, yeah, that was one of my personal frustrations. But I think if you chat to any person on my team, any of the front end devs, especially, um, they'll it probably helps. have their own reason why they hated SSR um, and the implementation of it. Uh, I think also that, that also extended past the developers because SSR created a lot of frustration in our platform engineering team as well in the way that they needed to change the way that they they rolled out the application to now support ssr um and add that additional complexity into the the crcd processes and the the infrastructure pipeline processes as well yeah so one of the comments was like um spa with ssr it, it's like we want rendering on client side but you know we want it from the server as well 
<laughs> yes. It is that middle ground. You're stuck, you're stuck yeah. in between a client and a server and you're not quite one or the other. Um, so it is a, a, just a, a frustrating place to be in as a developer. Yeah, true. Um, so Dylan, this was a really great session. It was based on experience, which is one of the best sessions that we can have. Um, because you know it comes from a real life scenario it's mm -hmm. not just um uh, some some textbook knowledge or something like that we've had a few of those actually during this devcon it's really great um so before we close off this session do you have anything any closing remarks you want to make for the viewers um you want to tell them <laughs> Um, nothing, nothing major. I think I'm, I'm really keen to see you guys in person uh, when we do finally get some time to, to come through to the island. I uh, do hope to see a conference that happens in real life in future. Um, if anyone is interested in what we do, um, please reach out. We do have offices in Mauritius and we're always looking for, for good, um, strong developers, especially with, within our stack space. Um, so if you, if you are interested, please do get in contact and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, we love Despite this talk, we do love Vue.js. We still roll it out in, in multiple places. <laughs> um, we do love Laravel. We love um, the entirety of that stack and, and um, as well as the, the modern platform engineering approaches. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> 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 you have your issues, but you, you, you've got to love it. Um, all right, so thank you very much for this session, Dylan. Uh, we are about to close off. Um, and see you in the next one. As you said, you want to be here physically. This probably is going to happen next year. Um, We're stay keeping in touch. our fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> stay Put in me touch. down. I'll be there. Yeah. Okay. We're going to keep you in the loop and let you know. All right, then. Thank you very um, much. Thanks for having me. Thank the you rest so much for your time. Show. Bye. Yeah. Cool. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Heavy douche. Yes, I hear that you are starting to ask like tech questions. Uh, is our website, the conference website, <laughs> an SPA or not? I, I, See, I'm learning. I'm learning. It's day now three are, right now. And like, you know, it's starting to like get in. It's sinking and, like, in. <laughs> but by next year, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be like, okay, I get that now. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's cool. SSO. I know what that is. <laughs> It's not so serious, I go around. Yeah, so, <laughs> <Not this point. laughs> so um, we actually have a podcast next. It's going to be a really interesting one. I'm looking forward to that. Um, let's see. Yep, that's at, yeah, that's what 1 p.m. This is not going to be a tech one, like a techie one, Marine. So you're free to express yourself as part of that podcast. <laughs> I mean, the title is self-employment as a techie, but it's really focused on the self-employment part. I think it's mm -hmm. more than just tech. It spans across all fields. So this is going to be super interesting. We are going to have a guest, Alexandre Basile, who is going to okay. join us, or Alex for short. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see you then at 1 p.m. Okay. So see you guys right. in a few minutes. Stay tuned. <laughs>